Hi, this is Dr. John Bergsman from the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology and Franciscan University of Steubenville. And we are here today talking about the readings for uh, Friday, July 31st. Oh my gosh, July is over. Where has it gone? And it is the memorial of St. Ignatius of Loyola, a great and holy priest and obviously the founder of the Jesuits. And so we remember him and his great contributions to life of the church. Uh, we particularly remember th things like the great Ignatian exercises that have been so influential in so many people's lives in uh, helping to people to find their vocation and to renew their vocation and to draw closer to the Lord. So St. Ignatius, pray for us. Now, uh, let's get into the readings here. Uh, as I have mentioned before, we are in this space between weeks 13 and 18 of year two where we're reading through the prophets. We're into Jeremiah. I mentioned on Wednesday that uh, Jeremiah uh, ministered between about 600 and, and 585 uh, BC during the period of the dissolution of the kingdom of Judah. Also, we can call it the kingdom of David and the last son of David to uh, visibly sit on the throne of the kingdom from Jerusalem was deposed during uh, Jeremiah's ministry. He had a very, very tough life. He was called to preach uh, rebuke and imminent judgment to the people of Judah for his whole career, and they never listened to him, and all the bad things that he predicted unfortunately came true, and he saw it all with his own eyes. So uh, Jeremiah had a tough vocation, and uh, we respect and honor him for it, and uh, we're inspired uh, by his example. Well, let's look at this. Uh, the, today's reading is rather famous and pivotal in the book of Jeremiah. It is the famous uh, temple speech in Jeremiah 26. There are basically two temple speeches where Jeremiah goes in and rebukes the temple establishment, one in chapter 7 and one in chapter 26. Of Jeremiah. This is the second and um, a, a more detailed account of Jeremiah going in and speaking against the temple. It says, In the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, this message came from the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Stand in the court of the house of the Lord and speak to the people of all the cities of Judah who come to worship in the house of the Lord. Whatever I command you, tell them, and omit nothing. Perhaps they will listen and turn back, each of him from his evil way, so that I may rep repent of the evil I have planned to inflict upon them for their evil deeds. Um, and so uh, the Lord says to go in and tell them, uh, if you... Disobey me, not living according to the laws I place before you, and not listening to the words of my servants whom I send you. I will treat this house like Shiloh and make this city to which all the nations of the earth shall refer when cursing one another. Now, what, are, what uh, the Lord is referring to here is that the tabernacle, the tent shrine built by Moses, once stood at Shiloh, and that's recorded in the opening chapters of 1 Samuel. Well, um, Eli, the priest, who was high priest when Samuel was a boy, you know, Eli was negligent and Eli's sons were wicked. And so the Lord allowed the sacred city of Shiloh to be destroyed and the um, Ark of the Covenant to be captured for a short while by the Philistines. So that is a previous time in salvation history when God allowed even his own sanctuary to be profaned out of judgment for his people's sins. And now God is speaking through Jeremiah saying that will happen again if you, the people of Judah, do not repent of your evil ways. But the people don't take that very kindly. Now the priests and prophets and all the people heard Jeremiah speak these words in the house of the Lord. When Jeremiah finished speaking all that the Lord bade him speak to the people, the priests and prophets laid hold of him crying out, you must be put to death. Why do you prophesy in the name of the Lord? This house shall be like Shiloh, and the city shall be desolate and deserted. And all the people gathered about Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. 
So the priests and all the people listen to Jeremiah prophesying this way, and to them it sounds almost blasphemous, or maybe even blasphemous, for Jeremiah to be preaching judgment against the temple and the holy city. And and you can imagine this could be very confusing if you were a devout follower of the Lord and uh, you come up to the temple to worship and you hear Jeremiah speaking against the temple. Um, that is kind of a sign of contradiction. That's That's hard to understand. And by a failure of of your intellect, you might just take Jeremiah to be some kind of blasphemer. And so this uh, put Jeremiah in a terrible position and he was he was abused and and tortured and imprisoned like our Lord would be. Uh, so let's actually move down to the gospel because we have a providential uh, uh, fit between the first reading and the gospel in today's Mass. It wasn't exactly intended that way, but uh, the gospel shows our Lord in a similar situation. Jesus came to his native place and taught the people in their synagogue. This is Nazareth now. They were astonished and said, Where did this man get such wisdom and mighty deeds? Is he not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother named Mary? And his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Are not his sisters all with us? Where did this man get all this? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his native place and in his own house. And he did not work many mighty deeds there because of their lack of faith. So the first reading and the gospel both show us two prophets, Jeremiah and Jesus, being rejected by the people because they are misunderstood or uh, just treated with disdain uh, for various reasons. Let's talk about one issue in this gospel reading, and that is about um, the brothers and sisters of Jesus. What's going on here? I thought that we believed that our Lord was uh, the sole natural child of his mother Mary. And that's true, but in uh, Judaism of this day, uh, as well as in older forms of Judaism and going back in the history of the people of Israel, uh, the Hebrew language and also the Aramaic language, which Jews later came to speak in the time of Jesus, neither of these Semitic languages have words for cousin and uncle and other family relationships. They just have brother and sister and father and mother. Those are the only familial terms, and everything else has to be worked out from there. So if you want to talk about your uncle, you have to say my father's brother and things like that. So as shorthand, they just called all their relatives uh, all their male relatives brother and all their female re relatives uh, sister. I mean, even in today's society, we have, you know, the use of the term brother, for example, in a broad sense, especially for, say, in the African-American community, but now not even just in the African-American community, but you'll, you know, folks will say, hey, bro, you know, so that's, uh, you know, your brother, your friend, you know, so we use it in this, in this loose uh, terminology. Well, they would use it for the for any any male relative. So when they talk about the brothers of Jesus here, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, and his sisters, these mean all his cousins, basically, in the city of Nazareth. In fact, we can show that James and Joseph, the first two brothers mentioned here, uh, are actually not the children of the Blessed Mother but they are the sons of a different Mary who was, uh, and that Mary was wed to a certain Clophus who tradition tells us was a brother to St. Joseph, the foster father of our Lord. So they were um, Jesus' cousins through um, St. Joseph's brother. Okay, uh, so anyway, that's just a little apologetic issue. But the main issue here is uh, how the people of Nazareth take offense at Jesus because uh, he's just a homeboy. He's just a uh, somebody who grew up in the hood, so to speak, in the community. Okay, he grew up in Nazareth, um, and they don't have respect for him because they are so familiar with him. You know, as the saying is, familiarity breeds uh, contempt. So uh, they don't want to take, they don't want to receive his strong teaching um, because they don't believe that he has the standing 
um, to be rebuking them and calling them to holiness and righteousness. So what are the first reading in the gospel really calling us to today? Well, in both cases, we have examples where God's people are deaf to a true message from a true prophet because the message uh, stings too much and they mistake or misunderstand the prophet and misinterpret him as an evildoer or an arrogant person or uh, something else like that. And so what is the spiritual message to us? Well, the message to us is not to mistakenly reject a true prophet due to some form of our pride. Okay? You know, and th- this can happen so much in the church and so much in society. We have political parties in society, and we each have our own narratives, and there is data that fits our narrative, and there's data that doesn't fit our narrative, and we are very resistant to acknowledging data that doesn't fit with the political storyline that we prefer. And this is true both on the right and on the left. I can cite examples from both sides, okay? Uh, And in the church, there are, you know, not officially, but de facto, there are kind of theological camps and, and theological mindsets in the church and We may not give them a name, but we know who they are, and we know what conferences they go to, and what bishops they identify with, and and what cardinals they like, and what cardinals they don't like. And this is true. It's not just left and right, but there's many, many variations on this, many, many different groups and and camps and schools of thought within the church. And um, and we don't want to hear somebody that we identify with the other side or the other camp, even when they have a valid point, okay? And, and so a true prophet or somebody that just doesn't fit in any school of thought or any camp, you know, comes along and just says what's true, and sometimes we don't want to hear it, okay? It doesn't fit our narrative. It doesn't fit our interests. It doesn't fit with who you know, who we want to get elected and who we want to be appointed and all these kind of things it doesn't fit with that. And so we, we reject the voice of truth, even when a person is speaking something that the Spirit laid on their heart and that is in accordance with the Scriptures and in accordance with the tradition. So what do we do? We need to maintain humility. We need to be listeners first before we speak. We need to hear what people are saying, extend them a line of credit, evaluate what they are saying in the light of the Holy Spirit that we've been given through the sacraments, in the light of the scriptures, in the light of the church's tradition, in the light of the teaching of other saints, including Saint Ignatius of Loyola, whose feast day it is today. He is a a luminous saint who we should revere even if uh, members of his order in subsequent generations may have done things that were not maybe in his spirit, should remember uh, the greatness of his uh, sanctity and what a gift he was to the church. And he too is a guide for us. Okay, And part of the Ignatian exercises was getting rid of pride and, and other impediments to hearing the voice of the Spirit speaking in our soul. So all of us in the church, myself included, this is a great day for um, getting rid of our uh, narratives and our prejudices and our little hobby horses and uh, our little pet projects and... Um, um, concepts, etc., to be willing to part with those things, to be willing to part with our pride, to humble ourselves and listen carefully to what our brothers and sisters in society and our brothers and sisters in the church are trying to say, trying to have empathy for them, listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking through them. It's not to say that there are not false prophets. There are. 
in the church and in society. But the way that we identify the false prophets is not by coming back with immediate anger and immediate judgment, but we recognize a false prophet when we humble ourselves in prayer and evaluate what they are saying uh, by the Holy Spirit and the scriptures and the church's constant teaching and the teaching of the other saints. And if we do all that and we still realize, you know what, that person's point or that person's message just is not in keeping with the Holy Spirit speaking through scripture and tradition and the saints, why then? then we can make a fraternal correction. But oftentimes we go through that pro this whole process and we realize, you know what? That person has a valid point of truth that I need to take and I need to accept. So this has been Dr. John Bergsma from the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology and Franciscan University of Steubenville. And we have been talking about the readings for the memorial of St. Ignatius of Loyola. Pray for us.